I want to go ahead and get started this evening. I want to thank you for joining us in, in uh, another installment of our search and recruitment for a city manager for the city of Columbia. You know, for many of you, when you see the city council and the mayor up here every other Monday night, hopefully we set the tone and the vision and the policy for our city, but it's our city manager that really implements the day-to-day -day operations of our city. And that's why the entire council felt it was important to include the entire community in our selection for what, when I speak for council, I say it was a very solemn and important decision, probably one of the most important decisions any council will make, and not every council gets to make this one. That's why about 90 days ago, we brought in CPS HR Consulting. They're a public-private partnership, a, a, a quasi-public agency that helps political subdivisions and municipalities and taxing entities across the country recruit high-quality, top-tier executives to lead municipal organizations. And we brought Pamela Darby and Andrew Nelson to Columbia, Missouri, and we said we want a very transparent process. We want to include Columbia and our community in this process. We have a very engaged citizenry. We have a very robust media that the person will have to understand to be successful in this position. And so they initiated a series of town hall meetings. We had two meetings, one right here in this council chamber and another at the ARC. Uh, we had 75 one-on-one -on -one meetings with individuals and stakeholders and organizations and not-for-profits and advocacy groups to get your advice and your input about what are the skills and qualities and attributes and qualifications you would like to see in the next city manager. We also had an online survey on the city's website that generated over 500 online comments. Now, all of this input was assembled into a candidate profile for the ideal candidate. And while nobody can embody all of these attributes, we certainly wanted to lead with those values of transparency and relationships and university skills and working together and transparency. And tonight, I am excited to debut those two finalists. You know, based on the input that our community provided, our HR team um, advertised in leading publications both here in Missouri, across the country, specialty magazines, women in government, Hispanic chamber magazines, other publications to recruit a diverse and qualified applicant pool. We received over 33 applications. There were 12 uh, applicants that fit the top tier of qualifications. The council interviewed six of them and we invited two to come back. Jim Polenik, the city administrator from Wisin, Wisconsin, and our interim city manager, John Glasscock from here in Columbia. I think the two of them give our community the opportunity to look at those skills and attributes and experiences in a new and different way. Both highly qualified individuals, both with a commitment to public service, and both with the qualifications that we expect in the next leader who will run the day-to-day -day operations of our city. This evening, I'm going to ask Andrew Nelson to come up. He's going to invite the two candidates to give a brief introduction to themselves and then answer several questions that the council has selected. I want to be respectful of your time as well. I want to give all of our stakeholders and our community that have been invited back, um, as well as the general public, to join us in a more informal setting across the hall um, for a little bit of reception so that you can ask your personal, your top priority question um, to each of the candidates, but then more importantly, give us your feedback on your experience. We have forms, feedback forms, um, that our HR consultants have prepared for us. They will tabulate that and summarize the results and share that with council. And while we will make the final decision, your input is important to us. And we look forward to hearing what you think of our two candidates. I know that our city will be well served by either candidate. And I appreciate the warm welcome that you have given to Mr. Polenik and the broad support that you have showed Mr. Glasscock in the last six months. And with that, I'll ask Andrew Nelson to come forward. Good evening, everybody. 
My name is Andrew Nelson. I am one of the executive recruiters from CPS HR Consulting, assisting the city with this recruitment. Uh, just a couple of housekeeping items for you. Uh, as the mayor mentioned, there are some several documents outside. If you did not get a chance to, uh, to get those before coming in, feel free to step outside and gather them. They are two candidate profiles, essentially a, a, a summarized resume of each candidate uh, of their previous years of experience and locations where they've served. Additionally, there's that comment form and a comment box, so we encourage you to uh, provide some feedback to the council, and uh, as the mayor stated, we will uh, summarize that information for them and for their use tomorrow. Uh, we will continue with this forum with four uh, preset questions. These questions were derived from a lot of the information that we received from our community outreach, and uh, while Everybody had different questions to ask. We tried to summarize them in best and the simplest form that we could use for this forum tonight. So we'll provide the candidates an opportunity to introduce themselves, uh, probably three to five minute introduction. And uh, then we will answer, have them answer four questions for you. Those questions will be available on screen and uh, they will also be broadcast via cable and live stream to those of you who are not in attendance here with us tonight. So with that, we will start with an introduction from Mr. Jim Polenik, the current city administrator in Racine, Wisconsin. Uh, good evening. Um, first of all, I would like to say um, a very gracious thank you to all of you. Obviously, your time is very valuable, and the fact that you've been willing to come out tonight and participate and engage in this, I think, speaks really well for the city of Columbia. I'd like also to thank Mayor Treese and the city council members, as well as all the staff. They've been incredibly gracious. Uh, this process has been really a, a wonderful thing to go through. I think it, uh, it sets a model for the way that such a process should be done. So I really appreciate what's been done in terms of the gracious uh, hosting that the community has done for me. So I, I thank everybody for that. Uh, my name is Jim Palinick. I am currently serving as the city administrator for Racine, Wisconsin. I've been in that position since uh, April of 2017. Uh, the city of Racine is a city of a little over 78,000 people. Uh, our budget is about $211 million. Uh, the general fund's about $82 million. We have about 737 employees. Stepping back a little bit, though, just kind of talking about my background. Uh, I'm uh, born and raised in a small town in southwestern Michigan. Uh, one of uh, three children to uh, a family of immigrants. My grandparents came over from uh, Ellis Island, and my folks were the first ones of their generation that were here. Uh, myself and my brothers were the first to go to college in our, in our family. And as I started thinking about going to college, uh, I imagine like all young people do, you know, what, did you, what do you want to do with your life? And I really wanted to do something that made a difference in my mind. And uh, you know, I probably could have made widgets, but I thought you know, there's something higher in terms of a purpose that I want to pursue. And I really saw government as that purpose. I felt that you know, somehow maybe federal government might be too distant, too far away, too difficult to achieve, and state was kind of similar to me, but local government was something that was close to the people, and that meant it made a difference, and you could really impact people's lives. And when I started to think about that, I realized there was such a thing called a city manager. And I started to imagine very early on that I had a job that I wanted to do. So I actually set out to be educated for that specific purpose. And I, I went to Western Michigan University, and I got both a bachelor's degree and a master's degree in public administration. And I focused somewhat in economics, and I worked throughout that time. And then once I finished my graduate school, I was able to do something that is rather unusual for people in this profession. And that is typically you follow one of two paths. Either you sort of start in a much larger organization and you work your way up in order to ultimately become a city manager. Or you do the opposite, which is much more rare, which is what I did, which is you actually start at the top. You become a manager in a very small community. So when I was only 26 years old, I started as the village manager of Dexter, Michigan. And it was a very small town, but the good news about what happens when you, when you do that in that regard is you're sort of forced to learn everything there is about government because you don't have any resources, you don't have much staff. So you sort of become the chief cook and bottle washer for all things local government. So you learn engineering, you learn law, and you learn public safety, and you learn uh, Department of Public Works, and you learn all these various things that government is, is part of. So it really helps you as you move through the rest of your career. 
And the bad part about it is, though, in order to move up, you have to move out. So that's why in many cases I moved on for a while because in order to further my career, it had to be a larger community. There was no other place to go to be city manager. Uh, so in a way, that sort of focused my nomadic career in some ways. But along the way, now I have served 31 years in local government in four different states. I've been a city manager for almost 30 years. Uh, I've done it in uh, a multitude of different types of places with lots of different challenges. Uh, I've had several cities with municipal electric utilities. Every city had major water and wastewater utilities. Uh, I've done lots in the way of economic and community development, both in fast-growing communities where it was new greenfield development and in older communities where oftentimes it was infill redevelopment, sometimes on contaminated brownfield sites. Uh, I've been a big champion and an advocate for community policing along the way. Uh, I've worked in uh, many different types of areas uh, within uh, local government, and I've enjoyed them all. And I continue to get a great deal of personal fulfillment out of what I do. And uh, as long as I keep doing that, uh, I will always love this profession and want to keep on doing it. So uh, I guess that's a, an introduction to me. I'm very, very pleased to be here. I really sincerely appreciate the graciousness that everyone has treated me with. And I look forward to the continuation of this process. So thank you very much. Mr. Glasscock. Hello, I want to echo what Jim said. I'm very honored to be standing here today in front of all of you. Um, I've served this community for 16 years and never once did I dream I'd be standing here uh, uh, being a candidate for this job. And I want to thank the council for their graciousness and how they've treated me through this whole process. Uh, it's been very warming to see uh, just how unified they are. So I'm John Glasscock. I'm currently the interim city manager for the city of Columbia, Missouri. And I'll tell you a little bit about me. I'll take you on a journey of, of my life. Um, I've had a great foundation. It started on a little farm west of Ashland, almost to Wilton. Uh, I grew up there with a brother and a sister. Uh, I'm the youngest. And uh, my dad started me out about relationships. I remember coming to this bank right across the street, Boone County National Bank at the time, uh, with my dad. Mr. Price was the banker. We borrowed money to go buy cows for Mr. Sylvie out on Fairview, just west of Fairview on a farm. And so he taught me how important relationships are. And so that's what I've tried to invest in is relationships my whole life. When I was 13, my father passed away uh, from cancer and a uncle took me under his wing and he taught me about work ethic. He set me on a tractor every summer from sunup to sundown, six days a week, and that's how I learned how to work. Um, thought it was very brutal at the time, but it taught me a lot about how to work. Um, when I get 18 years old, graduate high school, I think that's what I'm going to do the rest of my life. I get up to the farm, he says, I don't need you no more. Go find your own way. And that's what I did. I bounced around, I worked at 3M, I worked at South Farm, I worked at Clow, which is now JM Eagle, and I had to pull my own self up. And so I ended up at MoDOT in 1983, working as a surveyor. Some guy by the name of Wayne Murray thought I had some kind of promise, said, why don't you go back and get your civil engineering degree? Okay, that's what I did. I walked into Jay McGarry's office, uh, who's a professor and a counselor. He said, boy, you got a long road to hope. He said, you're 26 and you're not likely to make this. With his help, I made it in four years. Got a civil engineering degree in 1990, went back to MoDOT, went to work, highway designer. So I worked my way up there to the operations engineer, which I was then in charge of 13 counties, working with Boone County, Callaway County, all the counties around here, county governments, city governments. Uh, that's where I met Ray Beck. Uh, worked with him on Route B widening, first job up here that I did. And so I worked my way through. My proudest moment, though, working for MoDOT, is when I was asked to come and try to restart the Regional Planning Commission, which is 
uh, a group of counties and cities that in the center of the state that had become defunct. And so I worked with Karen Miller and all the counties around here to get that thing started. And we did. And it's probably one of the most successful RPCs today. So I'm very proud of that. 2003 comes along, George Montgomery, chief engineer of the city of Columbia, retires and I talked to Lowell Patterson, asked him what he thought about that. And he said, apply. And he hired me as chief engineer in 2003. Best move I ever made in my life because this is a community that values that. 2005 comes along, Lowell Patterson, Retires. Ray hires me as public works director. Never thought I'd be there. Never did. Do that for 10 years. 2015 comes along. Um, Mike Mathis steps me up to deputy city manager. You know, that's higher than I ever thought I'd be. Uh, it was an honor to serve in that role. Never thinking I would be standing here as interim city manager when Mayor Treese asked me to step in in 2018. I can tell you that's the proudest moment of my life. And, you know, the other thing that I will tell you is the success of the airport. We had to make changes out there. We were going downhill fast in 2007, and we had to change our model. We used to fly to St. Louis and Kansas City thinking that was what was going to make us successful. I go to Bill Watkins and tell him we need to fly to hub airports. We had to fight the airport advisory board on that. They did not believe that would be successful flying to Memphis, but it was, and that's where we are today. And so that's probably one of the proudest things that I have accomplished at the city of Columbia. So what's the vision for a city manager? Well, it's not very long term stuff, I can tell you. Um, <laughs> Ray was an anomaly. I never, I don't think that's ever possible. But five to, five to ten years, you know, what, what's the vision look like for me? So I want to add value. I mean, that's the big thing. I want to add value to the city of Columbia. You know, it, and we have five, if I've selected, we'll have five department heads open to have to hire. And we need qualified, diverse people in those roles. Uh, we need to review all our department budgets. We need to be more efficient. We need to spend it the way we're so supposed to spend it that the charter states and the ordinances state is our core services. We need to get back to what we do best. Third thing that I would tell you is we need to figure out the general fund funding and it's pretty rough right now as I go through the budget trying to put th together for the next year. You know, we'll have to have some hard conversations with council and, and the citizens of this city about a use tax, about how we fund public safety and, you know, other things. The other thing we need to do is develop a dynamic strategic plan, one that moves when we have to move and not, you know, give an end date to it. It should be dynamic because when priorities change, we've got to be able to change a strategic plan. So well, that's a vision, and I want to be totally transparent with you. I want you to know everything that I know. That's only fair. But the long-term goal, you know, you, you got to look longer than 10 years. And so if council just passed a uh, climate action and adaptation plan, that has to become part of the budget somehow, some way. We got to get to those goals that they've set in the next 30, 40, 50 years. And so there's going to be some hard choices that we have to make and how we do that. It's imperative that we succeed. And when we get there, we're going to look back and think, why didn't we do it before? So that's my introduction. I appreciate everybody here. Thank you, staff, for being here. Uh, thank you, council, for giving me this opportunity. Thank you. All right, we will now proceed into a kind of a question-answer format. Uh, each question we're going to ask our finalists to pr provide a response that uh, is about three minutes long. I'll try and give you an indication if we're close to exceeding that time limit. We'll start with Mr. Palahniuk. Uh, that first question is uh, regarding city manager's characteristics and attributes. 
The following word cloud generally represents the feedback received during the stakeholder engagement process. Which word immediately jumps out at you? What has prepared you to address that concept or exhibit that characteristic? And I'll put this on screen and give you a few seconds to, to look it over. Good. All right. um, I think when I look at that very long list of, uh, of words and have to pick just one, I'm going to have to pick vision. I think that if you speak to most of the people that have interacted with me for some period of time in my past, they will consistently use a word, and it is visionary. Um, that has followed me around, and I tend to be someone who sees the big picture, uh, that can imagine how things might be done in ways that maybe people didn't think of prior to that time, uh, maybe can and will take on challenges that people believed couldn't get done or couldn't get done in the way that they hoped uh, and get done perhaps quicker and better than they might imagine. And that's kind of been my operative mode. Um, I think that if you are looking for someone who is a status quo manager, that will be a trusted uh, hand on the wheel on keeping the ship going in the same direction, uh, that's probably not me. I tend to get bored without substantial challenges. I tend to be a change agent, but always a change agent uh, at the behest of my elected officials. Uh, when they determine the values, they understand the community's desires and needs and mission and vision and what they want to accomplish, then I think I'm the guy that basically can get that done and knows how to do that in the most efficient and effective way. Uh, so the other thing I think that's part of that vision is to assist in that process. Uh, I think the academics oftentimes will talk about this dichotomy between administration and um, politics and that uh, uh, one should implement, that is the administrator, the manager, and the other should make policy. But I think there is a role in there for the manager as well to assist in that process of making policy because they bring to the table a wealth of experience and knowledge and understanding and they can help in developing that policy and can be an advocate for it and can be a strong advocate for it and can be the messenger and the communication tool for the community and for others to make sure why that policy is uh, moving forward, can explain it, uh, can work on it, and can be there to uh, be the biggest supporter on behalf of the council. So again, that the concept I think is vision, big picture vision, seeing the future, finding ways to get to that future in the most effective, efficient way possible, uh, and to service and to serve the community and the elected officials in finding their way to that vision. So thank you. Mr. Glasscock. Well, I'm going to start with in relationships. You know, to me, that's probably the most important thing that I can bring to the table is relationships. It's what I've done my whole life. It's what I've done as public works director. Uh, I've built relationships with the city the, in, in, in the county, the university, uh, Boone County Fire District, Boone County Regional Sewer District. As public works director, you have to deal with all those entities and how to, how to make things work around here. We can't um, go it alone. The city can't do this alone. I'm just going to be honest. We have to have partners. We have to work together to get things done. We have to be more efficient in how we do things. Uh, I'm a face-to-face -face person. Uh, communication is very important to me. Uh, newsletters and um, emails work but I, I enjoy face-to-face -face interaction. I want to see what's bothering you. I want to see what I tell you something. If you're, if you're uh, squirming in a chair or you're smiling or you're frowning, that's what I want to see. But that way I know I've made the connection. If you, you know, that's all about what it takes. You know, I, I sit down with, with Ms. Ratliff and, and, and NAACP. I sit down with Race Matters Friends. I sit down with you know, the developers, and, and so those people are important. People are important to me, and so uh, that's where I'm at, and it, uh, I believe that's what we have to do to, to be a strong community. All right, the next question regards uh, government transparency. 
What is the importance of transparency in government? And how have you encouraged transparency within your own organization during your professional career? I think the importance of transparency is paramount. I don't think you can be an effective local government without being transparent. We have to be open, we have to be honest, we have to be transparent, we have to share information with the citizens and with the community. Because so much of what we do in local government involves the allocation of scarce resources. And when you do that, you wind up prioritizing things. And you talk about really hard, difficult decisions. And the worst thing you can do in that process is allow the citizens or the public or the community to believe that they're not getting the full picture, not getting the full story. So transparency becomes critical. You know, the taxpayers are the people that provide the government. They have an absolute right, they have a need uh, to hear everything that's there and to be part of a process to make those decisions. So I have always advocated for, believe very, very strongly in, and will continue no matter what, to think that transparency in local government is critical, uh, even to the point where it has damaged my career in the past. Uh, you may have actually heard about a lawsuit that I was involved in at one point in my career, and I'm more than happy to, to bring that up or talk about it. It had to do with the demand and the desire for transparency. There was a community that uh, basically violated the Open Meetings Act, and I damaged my career in filing suit against that, that community because it was important enough for me in that case to make the principle, to stand up for the principle, for openness and transparency. And that issue went all the way to the Supreme Court, the state of New Mexico. And ultimately, we made seminal law for that state. And it, it withheld the fact that transparency is that critical and is that important. And it showed that you can't operate without transparency and you can't violate the Open Meetings Act. So again, I will stand on that principle for as long as I do this profession, uh, whether you know someone believes in it or not, because I always will. So. Thank you. I'll just say Columbia requires it. Um, we have a journalism school that there's no way you can't be transparent in Columbia. I'll just be honest. <laughs> it, they're going to make you be transparent whether you like it or not. And if you don't honor that, they will make you pay. <laughs> so uh, how have I encouraged it? Um, I start with myself. I send many emails to council every day about things that happen in the city that they need to know about, whether that be uh, something in the police department, something in the sewer, something that they've asked for. Uh, they get it, whether they like it or not, they gotta know. Um, and, it's, and it's a massive amount. The public needs to know as well. We have, I believe, GovQA is what it's called, where you can go out and look at our books and everything. So we're very open, and, and we will definitely support that and keep that going. And um, uh, I'm going to be as transparent. Just, and when we get the budget out, I'm just going to tell you, it's, it's going to have a lot of things in it that you haven't seen before. Thank you. John, uh, we're going to go ahead and switch up and have you respond to this next question first. Number three, regarding diversity and inclusion. Diversity and inclusion are important values to the city of Columbia. What do those words mean to you, and what have you done to ensure those values flourish in your organization? So what they mean, you know, diversity is, is um, who's sitting at the table, uh, who's being recruited, who's been invited to the dance. You know, and, and so the inclusion part is, have you been asked to dance? Have you been asked, you know, your opinion and be allowed to speak it? Uh, it's very important that we do that. We're going to hire five, like I said, five new directors in the next months. That has to be part of the equation when we go forward and hiring those directors. Uh, diversity and inclusion would be, you know, one of the key milestones that we have to do. So. That's what it means to me. A community really needs to reflect the diversity within its community. That is, the organization of the city needs to reflect that. It owes that to its community. 
Uh, obviously, everyone should participate at the same level that they exist within a society. And the city should be the model of how an organization behaves. So diversity and inclusion is important to me. And I think throughout my career, I have worked to maintain that the city sets a model and sets an example for diversity and inclusion to the community as a whole. Uh, going back to City of Bay City, where I was the city manager, and we had one of the first female police chiefs in the country for a department that size. We even had a deputy police chief who was a female. So we had a sort of good old boy, uh, old-fashioned police department, if you can imagine, with uh, two females heading up that department. So that was really different. That was at a time in uh, mid-90s that you really didn't see that, and that was unusual. Uh, worked in a, a majority-minority community in New Mexico where obviously there's a large Hispanic population, large Native American population, very, very sensitive to and cared about making certain that we were strongly recruiting uh, uh, Latinos and people from the Hispanic community to make certain that we were reflective of that community as well as the Native Americans. Uh, in Racine, we have an African-American chief of police uh, we have worked very hard in the police department to increase diversity. Uh, our recently retired uh, HR director, who is African American, had changed um, the diversity in our uh, community as a whole from relatively small percentages to significantly more, and we worked hard to continue doing that. So again, I think it's got to be reflective of your community as a whole because you are the community, you reflect the community, you have to be a model of the community. And anything short of that is doing a disservice to the community. So hopefully I would continue to advocate for that, and we would model that behavior, and we would make certain that it was a principle that was followed throughout the organization. Thank you. All right, our final question of the evening regarding community-oriented policing. Please. Uh, please describe your definition of community-oriented policing and explain your experience and or implementation of this philosophy. Well, my definition is Jeff Jones. Uh, I, I, Community-oriented policing, you know, I, I heard it at council meetings. I watched people get up and talk about it in the back room and from this podium right here facing the council. That's my experience with it. That in the last four months, Jeff's been interim police chief we've exemplified community policing. And I will tell you that I don't believe I could have picked a better interim police chief uh, than that. Uh, we had leadership change, we needed leadership change, and we needed to do it effectively. And uh, he's done that, and I'm thankful that you applied, and I appreciate it. Thank you. When it comes to community-oriented policing, the operative word is community, and it's partnership with the community. It's relationships, and it's building those relationships over time. Uh, it's not about enforcing the law so much as it's about that protecting and serving, and doing so as a, a partner within neighborhoods, within communities, within parts of the community. Um, we have to work with schools, we have to work with community centers, with neighborhood groups, with faith-based communities, with activist groups, wherever those are, because they are the community. And we have to recognize that there are historically disadvantaged parts of our community that have been mistreated in many cases by law enforcement. And that's the problem, uh, that it's just been enforcement. It hasn't been from the approach of being a partner and someone there to truly uh, honor, to protect, to serve, and to be there uh, as a trusted friend and a trusted partner. Uh, I've been involved with community policing for at least 17 years in four different cities. Uh, in the city of Dwajak, I hired a, um, this is Michigan, I hired a police chief specifically to bring the concept of community policing to that community, and then we instilled it and continued to use it, and it's still there today. Uh, in Bay City, Michigan, of course, where we had the two female police uh, uh, chief commanders, uh, we, Obviously, we're working very hard at community policing, uh, bringing a uh, rather traditional force into the 21st century. Uh, currently in Racine, uh, our chief, I uh, had the benefit of having inherited a chief who was mentored by even, even a previous chief 
who first brought community policing in, and then he further enhanced it, developed it, and we've continued to develop it. We've developed it through a concept called cop houses, community-oriented police houses, where we buy actual homes within challenged neighborhoods, and we assign community-oriented police officers to those homes on a permanent basis. That is their beat. That's where they stay. They become entrenched in that part of the community. They become a part of that neighborhood, so people start to see them as such. Uh, we've done things like have um, uh, cards for kids of police officers with their vital statistics on it. So they start seeing a police officer like they would a sports hero, and they can trade with the cards so that they're not seen as an unpleasant occupying force, but they're another you know, pleasant person that they can interact with and see and actually someone that they can look up to and things like that. Um, events where you know the police department is hosting things at community centers where they're doing the police athletic leagues with the students, where they're working in the schools on a regular basis. I think you have to constantly work at it and, and, and have a completely different approach. It's, a, it's an approach, it's institutionalized, and it happens over time. It doesn't happen overnight, but if you continue to see it, continue to model it, then you're gonna change a culture, and that's really what it is. It's a cultural change, and I think you have to work at it in that regard. So thank you. Well, by now you know the dilemma we have. And I hope you have, uh, in your glimpse of these two candidates, know that we have two fine individuals of integrity and experience and qualifications with experience and vision for our city. Um, and while we have two good candidates, there's uh, only one we'll leave with the rose. Um, so <laughs> I will um, invite you to join us next door uh, where you can continue this conversation in a one-on-one -on -one, um, way with your priorities and your issues and um, the challenges that you see are facing our community. Uh, encourage you not to run either one of them off um, and uh, invite you to join us uh, next door while we continue this conversation. Yeah,